My name is Marcus van Elmsek, and it's my pleasure today to demonstrate in the second talk three exciting inter, uh, image processing projects, all related to the beating heart. Um, of course, these projects are not developed by myself. I did take them from the literature. And uh, here in the first slide, you can see the source where I took most of the data and uh, implementation know-how from. So we'll measure the heartbeat in three different ways. In the first example, I will be using optic flow applied to magnetic resonance imaging tagging techniques and basically uh, show you how to obtain a, um, a motion field for the heart muscle. In the second example, I will demonstrate how you can, just by looking at your face or somebody else's face, extract the heartbeat just measuring very tiny, very subtle color changes in the face. And last but not least, I will show how to magnify motions, very tiny motions like, the, uh, like on your wrist, showing the pulse. So since these are big projects, let's start right away and look at the optic flow example. Well, this optic flow example is a very serious biomedical imaging project, so I will have to explain a little bit up front uh, what the uh, data is, uh, where the data comes from, and uh, what the data means. Uh, we will be looking at uh, magnetic resonance imaging data. MRI scanners impose a strong magnetic field on the hydrogen atoms in the tissue that is to be scanned. Energy from an oscillating magnetic field is temporarily applied to the tissue at an appropriate resonance frequency to disalign the spin of the hydrogen atoms with respect to the strong magnetic field. And then, as excited hydrogen atoms decay back into their equilibrium state, they emit a radio frequency signal which is measured by a receiving coil. This radio signal can be made to encode position information by varying the main magnetic field using a field gradient. And then the contrast between different tissues in the body is given by the rate at which these excited atoms return to the equilibrium state, so basically by their decay rate. Now, this is standard MRI imaging, and you may have seen this before if you have been to a hospital or have seen medical data. Now, what's special about this particular case here is that we do MRI tagging. And in MRI tagging, a sinusoidal excitation pattern is applied. As this pattern decays, it moves with the tissue pretty much like a tag, thus exposing the motion within a homogeneous tissue type. Now, in this project, we will extract the harmonic phase from an MRI tagging pattern and apply opti the optic flow constraint equation to it to determine the motion field of the heart muscle tissue in a sagittal plane. So given all this description, let's go and uh, try what I just said. Uh, just for information purposes, I have here a magnetic resonant imaging device. Uh, a small picture, and these devices, they can uh, deliver uh, slices through the body, and these are now tagged slices that have been stacked up in time, so uh, that I can now convert these little 3D volumes that are actually stacks of 2D images in time into a little animation by converting them into slices and then animating these slices. So what you see here is basically a cut horizontal cut through a heart and uh, on the heart you see initially a kind of uh, wave pattern has been imposed and now as the heart moves uh, moves you can see here on the heart wall these patterns move along as well and due to the motion of these patterns it is now possible to extract the motion of the heart muscle and you also see here maybe uh, that in the middle of the heart and also in this part the pattern very quickly degrades, and that's due to the fact that these are the uh, heart uh, chambers where the blood is streaming through, and the blood, of course, being a fluid, does not uh, sustain a pattern. Now, this is being done for vertical slides, uh, sorry, for vertical patterns, and you can also do the very same for horizontal patterns, and then you get an image like this. Okay, this is our data, and based on this data, we'd like to extract now the vector field of motion. And to do so, we try to extract the harmonic phase from that pattern. The reason for that is as follows. The pattern you just saw is slowly decaying, 
and to determine the optic flow, we need basically an image where the luminosity does not decay. Now, we get this simply by uh, constructing an image not of the uh, amplitude of this wave, but of the phase. Because the phase doesn't decay as such, uh, such an image will maintain its luminosity. And we extract the phase by applying a garble filter. This is the kernel of a garble filter. It can have different directions. You can rotate it. You can change the frequency, low frequency, high frequency garble filter. And you can change uh, the phase, pretty much like going from cosine to sine and back to cosine. And pretty much like cosine and sine, you can create a cosine Garber filter, you can create a sine Garber filter, and then doing cosine squared plus sine squared, or basically here taking uh, the absolute value of the complex combination of these two, you can create the amplitude of the Garber filter just obtaining a signal like this. And here you can very nicely see that the amplitude is decaying in time. You see here in the hard wall, we maintain a signal. And in those hard chambers, the, the signal very quickly decays. But this does not hold true for the our phase. The phase is basically here calculated as the argument of the complex combination of the cosine and uh, sine Garbor component. And this will give us an image that looks like this, constantly a phase going from minus pi to pi, or in this case from 0 to 1. And as time progresses, you see that phase moving. And of course, the phase image does not uh, lose any of its luminosity. Now, we have to do the procedure that we just did for several directions, because there I just did it for uh, waves that are vertical. But uh, in principle, a wave or, or phase can progress in any direction. So I have to do this very same calculations for all kinds of directions. And uh, then I will take the strongest uh, signal as the main phase. This, uh, the phase with the strongest amplitude will be the main phase. And this is basically the signal that I get at the end. Uh, here, the luminosity or the brightness encodes the amplitude. And what you see in color, green and red, that's the phase. And you can see here the muscle somewhat twisting. And in a moment, we will extract this uh, very motion feature. Now the same for the horizontal tacking. OK, now that we have a phase image that does not decay, we can apply ordinary optic flow, uh, or the theory of optic flow, to that particular image. And this is the optic flow constraint equation that's based on the assumption that the luminosity is conserved. And basically, it says whenever luminosity changes in a pixel, it basically is the same as a divergence of the luminosity field or the, uh, the flow field. Uh, the luminosity has to flow in that pixel if the luminosity goes up, or it has to flow out of the pixel uh, if the luminosity decreases. And thus, all of this stays constant if luminosity is conserved. So that's basically a conservation uh, equation here. And that's what we have to solve. We see that the vector field, or the flow field, Vx and v Vy, uh, basically constitutes here two unknowns. And uh, as a matter of fact, we have two equations of these one for the horizontal tagging and one for the vertical tagging. So two equations, two unknowns. This gives us basically for every single pixel in the image or in the video an equation to be solved. And that's exactly what I do here. I use a Gaussian filter to obtain basically the derivatives in x and y and t for the data set at hand. And then for every pixel, I will have to solve this linear equation for Vx and Vy. And these are the matrices. This is the vector. And here I calculate the solution by applying linear solve to every pixel in that particular uh, case. And then last but not least, I get the solution. But the solution, of course, being based on real data is not perfect. So I will have some uh, obscure results. And those are. Uh, results that are imaginary. So I have imaginary flow fields, which of course I will discard. Furthermore, if the amplitude of the signal decreases below a certain threshold, like this one here, 
I will also create a mask and uh, anything that has uh, basically has an amplitude below that threshold or is imaginary will not be shown in the solution. So I just multiply here a mask uh, that sets everything to zero in that case. And last but not least, if everything has gone well, I can now generate with list vector plot on top of the image that I just generated uh, a vector field animation that shows here with list animate. And if I now stop in the third or so slide, you see very nicely that the heart, while it contracts, is also twisting, just like wringing out a, a cloth uh, to get rid of the water. So it wringes one way, and then once it's opening up again, it goes the other way around. So this is a beautiful way of detecting the motion of the heart in a in vivo a living and beating heart. And this is perfect for physicians to have a look if all the motion in the heart muscle is correct or if there's an indication for an infarct. Okay, so this has been methodology number one to look at a heart. And now we approach it, uh, the whole problem from the outside, basically uh, looking at the color of somebody's face. And since the heartbeat causes the facial color to change just slightly by pumping blood into the skin, we have a chance to detect that change in color. But this subtle change in color cannot be detected in a single byte encoded pixel. However, averaging over thousands of pixels, a color signal does emerge. And that's now exactly what we try to do. This project demonstrates all the required pre-processing steps and uh, to obtain the signal. And these pre-processing steps will be video acquisition, face detection, video stabilization, color demixing, and temporal frequency filtering. So please stay with me now while I have to do all these pre-processing steps to finally, at the end, hopefully, get a clear pulse signal. OK, as Shadi has shown in the previous uh, uh, demonstration, you can use connected devices to attach a camera uh, to Mathematica. You can just uh, look for any kind of attached cameras. In this case, I have two, one on my monitor and one built in on my laptop. I can select here, for example, just the first camera. I can open the camera or open the connection to the camera, that is. I can look for rules for settings for that particular camera. So I see I have a frame rate of 12, a raster size of 320 times 240, a time out of 120 seconds, and so forth. So in my case, I will increase the frame rate to 18. Then I will uh, read. Uh, in all the images, but I won't do that right now because at the location where I am at, uh, it's already starting to get dark. So um, I will use a pre-defined uh, or a pre-recorded uh, video. So at this point of time, I just close the camera, and then I could just look at the video if I would have recorded that uh, previously. And last but not least, um, we can just extract meta information from any frames that have been taken by a camera. And thereby, you can also extract the absolute time, so the exact instant of time when an uh, image has been taken. So uh, this will help later on, too. Now that we have the video in Mathematica, you can actually get a picture of me. This was taken after a round of jogging. So uh, I'm a little reddish in the face. That makes the whole recording a little easier. And uh, you don't see really much. Uh, this is an animation, but it doesn't look like an animation, more like a still standing photo picture. Uh, and uh, this is basically now the recording that we'll utilize to uh, measure my uh, pulse. And here in an extra file, oops, I have to delete this. I now have all the timings for each of the frames here. OK, now that I have the data in, uh, inside, I can actually work on the data. So this will give me the first frame. This will extract already, well, I've, this has already been done, the bounding box of my face. And then, uh, as you can already see here, this would be a bounding box of my face. Now, since I'm only interested in my face in this particular application, I will do this for every single frame in the video, so I map find faces to every frame in the video, and I will always extract the first face that's there. Hopefully, it finds at least one. And thereby, I create now a long list of uh, bounding boxes of a face. 
And in the next step, I will look at the average bounding box size by basically taking the differences in X and Y, uh, then determining the median, and then rounding the whole thing up to a multiple of 16 plus some uh, 10 uh, pixels of ba uh, padding, which I will need uh, to take away later on. And last but not least, I will also look here for the center position of every bounding box by and by regularizing this a little bit, applying a Gaussian filter to the mean of all these coordinates, and then rounding it to integer numbers. And last but not least, I now trim every frame that I get with image trim, and uh, by specifying now the uh, as trimming coordinates uh, the bounding box size and bounding box location. So having done, my video has now been reduced slightly. You see me now, just uh, just my face in that video. Okay, so we have this. Uh, but what you may have noticed here is that uh, this is not particularly uh, stable. Uh, I'm bouncing forth and back uh, simply because it's hard to stand still in front of a camera, even though the camera has been fixated. Uh, so this motion of my head has to be taken out. I'd have to stabilize this video. And this is what the next slide is all about. Here, uh, <clears throat> I basically take now a reference frame, which I just take in the middle of the recording, halfway through. So this is frame number 90. And then I will try to find uh, ge ge uh, the, geomet sorry, the geometric transformation with, ref uh, with respect to that particular frame. Uh, in, in relation to every other frame in that uh, animation. So this will find a geometric transform that takes any face or any frame of that video and uh, puts it into relation to the reference frame. And uh, as a result, I get a transformation that would basically, a rigid transformation that would take that particular frame and map it exactly onto the center frame. So doing this and then applying actually this these transformations onto uh, the list of images onto these faces with a map thread and here are all the transformations and applying this via image perspective transformation i now create a list of frames that all should basically be at the very same position so these are now called frames these frames are called stable faces and since they will be moving around a crop five pixels on every side. And uh, if everything worked well, I obtained this little video and you can see me. Well, there are some facial expressions left, but basically you see myself standing still in this particular video. Okay, so I'm now ready to actually extract the signal from the skin. And for that purpose, I have to quickly, uh, quickly derive uh, what's called a skin detector. Now, a skin detector is fairly easy to construct because a skin detector will only work or be based on color. So if I can recognize skin color in an image, I'd be fine. And in order to train that, I quickly by hand created a mask like this one. And this mask, this mask uh, will um, be used then to uh, uh, generate training data. And I can generate this mask interactively by, well, I cannot, well, since I'm in demonstration mode. But if you click here, if you're not in demonstration mode, which I can create here, I go to working mode. If you click on an image, you get a toolbar at the bottom. And this toolbar allows you to, for example, create a mask by doing it interactively. So I can create masks for where I know that I do have skin in my face. And once I have created this mask, I can just say mask and copy, and then I can paste it here, and this would be the mask that I get. Well, I've done this prior to this uh, talk, and what you see here is a, um, a skin mask, which is a binarized version of this uh, image down here. And this I can now use to try to find out what the typical skin color is. Well, to find out or to, uh, to display the colors in an image, we have a chromaticity plot uh, in three dimensions. And here I basically display all the pixel colors in the previous image in an LAB color space. 
Um, this is not RGB color space. It has some advantages over RGB in the sense that it is uh, more true to the color metric. And this will be helpful, as you will see in a moment. And well, looking at the color distribution, you already can tell this looks like the branch with the skin color. The rest seems to be different color, uh, different pixels. And we can specify or verify that by simply multiplying now my skin mask onto the frame. And there I see now all the skin colors. And yes, that assumption was correct. This region in the color space seems to be a good classifier for skin color. Now we can do that automatically by just uh, applying classify uh, to this associations of color data. And then I obtain here a skin classifier that way. But I won't do that because the resulting classifier will not be as snappy, not as fast, uh, being applied to a whole list of uh, images. And therefore, I will quickly construct a simple Gaussian kind of classifier by just uh, constructing a kind of a Gaussian distribution in the vertical around these colors, measuring the uh, mean of, whoops, the mean color. And this should be frame one should be frame one and by uh, calculating all the sigmas here and then I can create a skin classifier I can apply the skin classifier onto the first frame to just see if it's working yes it seems to be working I have some false positives here on the side but eventually they don't matter and then I apply that skin classifier to every single frame as you can see it's already done and Adding up all these weights, I get basically now a skin weight, a kind of a weighting image that I can now apply to all these uh, frames that I have to extract the skin color. Let me go back to demonstration mode and to the next slide. Okay, now that I have the skin weight, I can basically go and extract from my, all these frames from my lab faces via image measurement the mean color values. And that's exactly what I do. I get these as now the lab LAB signals. LAB stands for the color space. And now I can do a list line plot to see what I got. And unfortunately, this does not look very convincing. You don't see a pulse really in these color data uh, lines. Well, I can focus on the color. This is the luminosity part of the color. This is are the two color axes. So I can just look at the A and B axis, and still I don't really see a pulse. I see somewhat of a pulse, but not really. Well, the reason for that is, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the color change due to the heartbeat in the face is not along the A or B axis, but it is somewhat in between. So what we have to do is a kind of a demixing uh, of these color channels with respect to uh, uh, to what the heartbeat is doing. And uh, I can do this by hand interactively here just for demonstration purposes. And as you can see here, depending on alpha, you don't really see a nice uh, uh, pulse signal, but for certain uh, uh, values of alpha, uh, something like a, like an alpha, uh, like a, a pulse signal comes through, like here for this value, which is, I think, roughly, uh, well, let's go. And this is the best one, roughly, for this signal. I get a somewhat reliable pulse. And uh, I just extract the signal and just plot it once again. And this will be the signal that I get in and on which I can do some statistics or signal processing. I will do that exactly here. I will uh, convert the data that I have now into a time series. A time series has a benefit that I can basically uh, merge together, combine the times of a certain measurement and the value of a certain measurement. Please recall these are the, uh, time for, uh, the times of each frame. And this is now the signal that I obtained. So combining this gives me a time series. And the time series can very nicely be, nicely be plotted. And please note, this is pretty much the same plot as before. But here I have now proper time axes going from 0 to 10 seconds. The whole little video did exactly exactly take 10 seconds. All right, now, well, we do see here some artifacts. And uh, well, we can take some additional knowledge about the heart into account. We know that the heart rate, unless I'm really seriously dead or sick or 
uh, maybe hyperventilating, should be somewhat in the range of half a hertz, so 30 beats per second, or something like 180 beats per second, so 3 hertz. So knowing that it's somewhat in that interval, I can apply a bandpass filter to the time series, and I get a somewhat better signal. Uh, so what I will do now is uh, simply apply fine peaks directly to these unfortunately unregularized data sets. Maybe I go here to a higher regularization term. And again, I have this problem. I have to go to regular signal. This gives me a time series again, and I can plot this uh, signal. And this will give me now an idea of what the heart rate looks like. Well, here we have a false reading. We have an intermediate double take, but uh, we should be able to handle this. And this will allow me basically to read off the heartbeats uh, just by looking at the interval between every beat, which is roughly one second or a little less than a second. So taking the mean gives me 0.67 seconds. And this I can convert to hertz. And you can still see that I was still a little bit out of breath when I take, took this video. I have here 88 beats per minute. And I can also look at the standard deviation. And uh, now due to the fact that I have here an unregularized data set with some extra beats, I get a pretty big confidence interval, anything between 67 beats and 127 beats, which is, of course, a little too large to be reliable. But anyhow, you saw maybe counterintuitively counter that it is possible to extract the heartbeat from somebody's face just by looking at the color. Now, that's already quite amazing. And uh, to just put uh, one more project on top of it, it has to be a bit more am amazing. And uh, I will almost do the very same. But instead of looking at somebody's face, I will now look at somebody's wrist. What you see here is a wrist and the challenge of this project, the last project I'm about to show, is as follows. I re will record a video of this segment, and then I will try to amplify the motion uh, to make the pulse visible. The pulse that's mostly hard even to feel uh, will become visible in this uh, sub-image. OK, for that purpose, I have to get the data into Mathematica. And in order to keep that easy, I did pile all the data up into a volume, image volume, which I now slice up into a movie. I know that the sample rate of this movie was 30 images or 30 frames per second. And now I can animate this via list animate. And uh, unless, of course, maybe the disturbing flicker that we have today, unfortunately, due to the, due to the broadcasting, um, you may see that you don't really see anything. This looks like a standstill image. There's barely any pulse to detect. Only if you really know what to look for, you may see very, very tiny motions in this area. But uh, well, if it would be easy, this project would not be any fun to do. So how does the whole line of thought go? The, uh, I want have the time now to go into the mathematical detail of this project, but I just uh, basically motivate what's going on. If L would be the luminosity function of one of the, uh, well, the grayscale uh, image or a uh, color channel, then moving the luminosity function or shifting it, uh, or shifting the movie basically locally by delta would basically mean that you can basically subtract here the argument from x, but well, subtract delta from x, or what you could do as a linear approximation, you could say, well, the luminosity changes linearly by just taking the old luminosity and by subtracting delta times the derivative of the luminosity at that position. That's one way to do it. And you could amplify this uh, derivative. That's one way to amplify motion. Another way to amplify motion is to look uh, at the whole thing in Fourier space. And so if L had would be the Fourier transformed of my luminosity function, then a shift by delta would basically be a multiplication by a complex factor, e to the power of i omega delta. And this uh, so linear approximation is similar to this. Or, and that's basically now the uh, target, if we want to amplify delta to a times delta, then all we have to do is to multiply this complex phase or to multiply this 
complex part of the linear factor in front of the uh, Fourier transform. So any of these approaches will roughly work and uh, what exactly is going on, I unfortunately do not have the time. So I have to refer you to this particular publication. This is a link you are welcome to look at and uh, what you see down here is nothing else but a mathematical implementation of what has been described in this particular article. So there's uh, something like a image up and down sampling routine which I used uh, for in combination with a low pass and high pass filter here to construct a, what's called an image pyramid uh, and what this does I'll show in a minute and then I have a, need a Reese transform, I need some utility functions and eventually a motion amplifier. All of this works together in the following way. If I just take an image like here, the first part of an image, I can now uh, disassemble that image into different layers, uh, different resolution layers into a pyramid. This is done now by the command to pyramid and basically it will take that image and to a fine resolution image and a coarser resolution difference image, difference image, difference image to a coarser and coarser layers and eventually have an absolute image left. Uh, and then eventually, once you do this, you can uh, also re reassemble the whole image by taking this uh, absolute value image, uh, upscaling it, upsampling it, uh, adding the difference image, upsampling it again, adding the difference image and so forth. And eventually, if you do that, you can then reassemble uh, the original frame. Now, why do we do that? Well, the reason is that essentially we to have taken the derivative at different wavelength. And uh, here, basically, I have more and more stable signals because I do average over lots of lots of pixels down here. And what we do eventually is we take this, this, and this layer, and eventually also this layer, and amplify um, the... Uh, uh, whatever swing, uh, goes through a bandpass filter at a given frequency, the frequency range in this particular case will be, okay, this takes a little bit because there's a lot of data on the next slide. hope it does not take too long. Here we go. We'll go through a temporal filter as well to single out the prominent uh, motions that we're interested in. And since we know the uh, rate at which this is going to beat the heart, it's something between uh, 0.8 and 1 hertz, I put in a temporal filter that will be applied to these components. And then I basically amplify every subband of the pyramid, which I basically assemble here for every frame, amplify everything, and then reassemble everything back into a frame from that pyramid. I can run this. And this takes a little bit to run, about half a minute, so I skip this, and this is the result. And if you look very closely, you can see here now a general motion, of course, of the wrist, but also a small motion here that you can detect the, uh, the actual pulse beating. Here is a small variation visible, and if you look closely, also a small variation up here. Okay, so this has been a kind of a third approach, how to go into uh, the human body or look into the human body and trying to measure the uh, uh, beating heart.